31st birthday uh, on the 27th of February. <laughs> just for the purposes. <laughs> But um, what I, what's the significance of that is, of course, first of all, I look at life through the baseball metaphor, um, and I've done a lot. Um, it, it, there's copies of this available, right? Oh, yeah. And you can see that uh, for a high school dropout, I didn't do too bad. But uh, that doesn't mean I dropped out of school. I didn't stop reading, I didn't start studying. Uh, I simply was able to read what I want, my energies, do what I wanted, and had the independence of always being self-employed. And I think that's the segue into what this conference is all about on self-employed artists. I think the, the, uh, the way I look at it is I am the business person trying to uh, tell the artist that there's really a lot of stuff in here that's uh, right down your alley the tradition says why I've got to be starving, you know, why I've got to be suspicious and stuff like that. And that's the way it's in business too. But I think that uh, as I've advanced in my own uh, development of this chart, I, I find the word entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, because, you know, institution, uh, there's children here, I can't do some of the words. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and notice, you can raise that joke, you can, you can see the words that I use to describe what's involved in self-employment uh, and the success of self-employment. Those, those are all good words, but I don't think they really define, you know, one person's imagination is another one's boredom. So you, you really, one size doesn't fit all. So now I've advanced uh, further, and I have developed this poster, which is available, um, and these are for no cost to you. Uh, and uh, but it, it's added the isn't. So the, the next word I point is, and I don't have a slide for this, but the poster's here. And what I've done is I uh, created the word entrepreneurism because there's all, there's all the isms, and in the entrepreneurism. The ISM stands for intimacy, sensuality, and mystery. And I think because of uh, H has its privileges, that uh, I think that's before the business plan, uh, you want to have those three areas uh, identified, and you have to be doing your search for success through those. There's really no sense writing a business plan about a business that you're going to do that you don't like, or just to do a business plan because it should be done. Uh, I, think, I think one of my problems with education, formal education, they were always giving me homework I didn't like to do. They were never asking me to do a paper on baseball or football or uh, whatever. Uh, and kids that liked uh, grammar and geography and stuff like that, uh, they were very, they were home free because they were writing about what they liked. But I don't know what about. I could go see that stuff if I want to see it. But uh, what do I care about what order the presidents came in? So I want to find that out. You know, what's that, what's that, what's that, what's that. Uh, so, you know, you get into these academic discussions today of core knowledge, uh, which you're spending if you read the, you know, what's going on in the editorial pages, core knowledge and what should core knowledge be. And, experiential education, what should that be? Um, and I think that uh, now you have uh, perception education, which you, to me is very valid, but because not many facts are used anymore. And uh, so my whole purpose here is to try and be more factual and related to uh, what artists or fine people in the fine arts should be doing. So when I talk about these sort of things. I've created this collage of things that sort of describes my life and some of the views of the isms of, of uh, entrepreneurship. Now, in connection with that, as a corporate executive, and I had CPA firms and I started uh, a lot of businesses for clients and met a lot of business clients. And then I sold that at age uh, 80 um, because it was a, it was a, it was a energy 
Carnegie Burning Business, and uh, I took over a chocolate company of all things. Talk about jumping into the, something that's going from accounting to chocolate. Uh, I really love accounting, and I still love accounting. Uh, it's still on my own account. But I equally, as you can see, like chocolates too. <laughs> of course, dark chocolates with all the antioxidants that's put on my alley. So here I am, 81 years old and healthy and wealthy and wise, I think. But <laughs> during, my, during my career, uh, my art genes were always there because if I was interested, for instance, in chocolate, then this, these are uh, sort of a brochure on chocolate art. And I'll just pass this around for people to look at. And there's interesting things. There's chocolate sculptures in there. There's chocolate paintings in there. There's artificial chocolate pieces that we use in the candy shop because uh, Fannie Mae Candies was famous for their non-preservative uh, classification in the chocolate so that they would melt at 70 degrees. So we tried to, at artists and other employees, we taught them uh, how to make artificial pieces. So you see artificial chocolate pretzels and coconut butter for those that you know that white chocolate is really coconut butter and, uh, and uh, chocolate covered toffee, for instance. You could uh, manufacture those and they wouldn't melt. However, that doesn't mean that people still thought they couldn't be eaten. So every once in a while in some of our displays, people would actually even though they're glued to this display or the bottom of the box, they would work and pull them off and pop them in their mouth. <laughs> and we had a uh, project with the University of Illinois where the students in the Jerry Hills, who was here, uh, not here, they, he used to, because they were right across the interstate from us, like he would send students and he himself would come over. And we always had chocolates out on trays throughout the kitchen. And uh, he'd want to know if he could take them back to his night classes really went well, so we said fine. So we were experimenting with uh, artificial pretzels, and there was a whole bunch of them in our, uh, on the offices of our store manager. So he helped himself to them and took them back to class. And when I came back from lunch the next day, I heard the secretary on the phone trying to explain that uh, he called and said something about there's something wrong with those pretzels, or they weren't edible. But the thing was that I think he took 50 to class and we said, well, bring him back. But only about 45 came back, which is kind of scary because he took five of those kids, eight was pressed. <laughs> and of course, some came back already gum, two of them. So, so I, I think that's the, uh, you know, if you're so good at your art work, why the success is some other problem. The ism of ISM has, uh, uh, I is for intimacy. Uh, intimacy is my coming down here and walking around and talking to you person to person and wanting to know how you feel and uh, what you like and what you dislike, uh, caring about you. For instance, if I get on an uh, airliner and I'm uh, tired, let me the slides are right over. If I get on an airliner and I'm tired, and uh, as soon as I sit down, they, one of the crew members comes up and says, would you like a glass of wine? And so what kind? Would you like a beer? Would you like a cocktail? Um, would you like a hot? I mean, that's intimacy. That's somebody caring about their customer. Uh, that's what we <coughs> as consumers want to have. And that's what has to happen in your businesses. Uh, some people will call that networking. Uh, some people resist it. Here's the work in process I have, that when you get into these, uh, call on three of your clients every day, chat about what they're doing, respond to this house, and I follow up and follow up, and, and you folks can read that, I think. Uh, spread your email address around, get some spam. Spam is worth all you can eat. I don't know if any of you tasted spam. <coughs> I grew up on it during the second world war. Reinvent your vocabulary, ask your colleagues for the words and phrases you use all the time. Now, having been involved in this conference, what, six years, Gary? Yeah. The yes. vernacular here has changed. And it's changed two ways, by, by the consumers, the artists that are here, 
I hear them using more business friendly terms. There's more tolerance for profit. There's no, no more tolerance for loss, but there's more tolerance for profit, uh, which is the purpose of that. I hear the tolerance for creating jobs. Um, I hear the tolerance for understanding basically about financial statements. Um, did I pass out? No. You have the chocolate. And, uh, also, one of my uh, baseball, of course, and, and this is baseball art, just samples of baseball art. But if you look at my own collection, I have Western art, I have military art, I have uh, almost every one of the endeavors I have. I have uh, art, unfortunately I have a daughter who's an artist, so she brings things that I like too. So, um, but I think that uh, it's the same way with the speakers. Now I feel that I try to embrace the uh, intangible of the artist, if you will. Uh, I like to be a free spirit and not politically correct. I'm independent, speak my mind. Um, I don't uh, want to compromise uh, ethics. I don't want to do things that I might have to do if I was in publicly held corporate America. And there's a big difference. Uh, publicly held corporate America represents about 10,000 of those businesses are public owned known as on the stock exchanges. And it's those businesses that have a certain amount of mischief in them and you can bet about that. And of course that's the ones you hear about. But there's 27 million non-publicly held businesses. And of those 27 million, there's about 20 million that are sole proprietors. For instance, like myself, when I ran Fannie Mae Candies, I was never an employee. I was an independent contractor. Uh, CEO, and I told the board what to do. I didn't have the board telling me what to do. And I'd send them an invoice each month for my services. And I found that in life, if you really feel that you want to be good, that you don't have to work for somebody else. Regardless of what you're doing, if you really get to a level where you're good, I don't mean that to be arrogant or egotistical. The need for excellence, regardless of what it is, is so strong that you don't have to work for somebody else. That's true if you're an artist, it's true if you're a nurse, it's true if you're a doctor, it's true if you're a CPA, it's true if you're a lawyer, uh, it's true if you're a teacher. Every, every profession and trade there is, if you really can meet that standard of those things that make you good, which are, you saw in the earlier chart of what an entrepreneur institution is, uh, you, you can name your own game. Uh, so, I see reinventing the vocabulary taking place for every decision maker benefits. Uh, is it the client? If not, focus on your decision for another 10 concentrated minutes and work out a way to change it. Uh, and then, have you ever been invited to a client's birthday party? If not, make the invitation your mission. And that's what I used to do. Uh, this past birthday, I didn't have a big party. 81, you're really not into parties that much. <laughs> you can't, can't drink as much, there's no girls jumping out of the cake. Uh, you know, but, uh, but, and I've been married 60 years, so my wife tolerates a lot of things. So, uh, but I think the, uh, but the thing is, I used to have three or four birthday parties every year, um, particularly on my 50th birthday. I had disguises and everything, so that, uh, that I wore and humored everybody. And, drank as much as I wanted, and said anything I wanted. So, but it was a lot of fun at that age. But 81, you're not, uh, you're not into all that. So I don't know if you're any wiser, I think you're just tired. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the intimacy. I'm not selling, you know. Uh, I'm talking about helping you. I mean, these days, the help I need is getting across the street. <laughs> but you folks need help. Uh, you're here for help. And you're not, you're not begging for help. I don't mean to be doing anything like that. You're, you want to do what it is to make you build to that level where you're good, where you're excellent, and where you can live this kind of life without having to compromise too many things and too many people. And with, the market's growing like 310 million people in the United States today in globalization and things. 
the market becomes better for all of us. Right? I never worried about advertising in the candy business. If I made my pro product as good or better than the next person, I didn't have to worry about increasing my sales. The population in its own way would increase our sales. And we have former executives. My Kennedy was chief operating officer. Uh, and uh, so Joe Roberts has been a friend of ours for years. And so they know how that, that worked. So you, you don't have to be greedy. You don't have to get more than your share. Now the sense is essentiality. In their taste and touch, smell and see, and hear. Now, every business has an aroma. Uh, I, when I had the accounting business, I had maybe 135 different businesses. I could go in blindfolded, I think, and tell you what business I was in. Now, the chocolate business, in addition to being a minimum business, it's a taste, touch, smell, see, uh, business. So, to prove that, I brought chocolate. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can touch them, you can taste them, you can see them, and you can hear your cow chewing them. <laughs> <That's another basis. laughs> and you can love them, and you can touch them, and they're sensual. Even sexual. Careful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was given a compliment. I used the phrase, uh, uh, candy is dandy, but liquid is quick. <laughs> but in any event, um, so when we get into the senses of things, you can smell a new car, right? Yeah, we, we had some students down in, at Bradley University in Peoria. They bottled essence of Peoria <laughs> And they sold them for a buck a bottle. And they made a lot of money. <laughs> but so you, you know you can you can make a living off of those five senses. If you think about uh, how do I want that to be? So uh, you know, come up Lead with the senses of it, if that's what they are. Smell, see, touch, taste, or feel. And then, of course, we have some other senses of movement. They go hand in hand, and we have senses of passion. Um, so I think you have to be aware of all of those uh, senses, but do it to the point it becomes natural. Uh, establish the sensory priorities of your work. Where, where are you strong? Where do you have to work to create a visual representation of your evaluation? That might be a business plan, you know, so that uh, I'll make music a priority. Now, I'm a music guy. You know, I've always had a desire, and actually, if I drink enough, I can sing country and western songs <laughs> and do line dancing. <laughs> but uh, and the older you get, the more inhibitions you lose. <laughs> but any independence, great to Finding music is a great stimulant, and you hear it. And why do you hear music? And uh, I think that's uh, what. And then finally, if you're a great design, share your favorite examples from CD covers, dictionary, whatever. You see them around here. Uh, so I think the senses of, of experiencing your business, when you learn to love a business, how do my senses react to that? Do I really want to do that? Uh, is it painless to do? Uh, my accounting work was painless to do. My chocolate manufacturing was painless to do. Uh, our charitable work now, uh, Mr. Hennessy runs the Coleman Foundation, and I'm uh, what they call chairman emeritus. It was like being in Being what? Being what? But uh, like in any event, he was not one. I set up the Hughes Foundation, so I have something to do to overcome that situation. <laughs> anyway, uh, but, uh, but I think that, so it's fun giving money away. It's, it's harder to give money away than it is to earn money. It really is. If, if you, if when you're making money, there's an expectation of productivity and measured achievement. So if you're going to give money away that you earn and pay taxes on, which already you know, makes it less, 
and you want to achieve something with it, like we're doing here, then we have to see what kind of expectations there are for what kind of measured productivity can we get for that expenditure or that investment. How much bang you can get for your buck, you mean? Zappy <coughs> wouldn't let Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to highlight you. Yeah. Any words. Put a red dot in there, yeah. <coughs> But I think the, uh, but you're right. I mean, how much, uh, whether it's giving money away, or whether it's doing it for profit or tax exempt purposes, and that's where young people are going to not now. When you see this great transition of wealth that's going through the society today, which I haven't seen a great deal of, yet, but it will happen. Uh, there will be in younger people. We've already seen that there's more desire to be involved with that. There's more desire to be uh, helpful in the cure of Katrina or some of these natural disasters. At the same time, participating in what is the result. Uh, so, so I think that uh, that that will change, and I think that that's the involvement, and that's what happens when you when you give money away. So it really is more difficult. There's a huge amount of money. I mean, there's 70,000 foundations like ours alone. How many can you name by heart? <laughs> so uh, it's the same thing with uh, the stocks. If you if I ask you how many corporate publicly held companies can you name, you probably all can list uh, a good many. And then I ask, well, okay, that's just 10,000. That's good, you didn't know that many. Now there's 27 million non-public. How many can you name? Well, I bet if I went around the room, we'd probably be lucky if uh, anybody could do more than one, now that you know me. <laughs> but, uh, I, but I think that's the the things that you have to be aware of. There's more going on that sympathizes with your endeavors than you realize. There's more people that want to help you than you realize. But you have to do that reaching out and use your senses of who are those people. And I, you know, I can say that I think there's probably more hate in the country today than there was when I was a kid. Uh, you have to be driven every place today. And when I was a kid, it was an adventure. You know, you got into fights, you walked through neighborhoods, you uh, experience life firsthand. The kids don't get a chance to do that today. And it's unfortunate because uh, for whatever the reason, we've kind of lost our way, we've cheapened life, and uh, it isn't necessary to do that. But the only way that I know how to do that is for me to come here with these fellows and people and tell you firsthand and let you challenge me. Oh yeah, Mr. Hughes, what about this? And uh, Mr. Hughes generally has an answer. <laughs> I can dance. That's the census now. So remember what those are. And then finally, we're going to get into the mysteries. Now, in here, uh, say, ask everyone to work a story that reflects what makes you uh, think special. Now, dreaming is the mystery. You know, we dream great dreams. And um, you know, there's a great line. I dream, I dream of you, and maybe someday they'll come true. And I think that uh, that's very poignant for what to expect out of your young lives. If you can dream, you can realize the, the mysteries. Uh, and as, as for a story, I don't know if any of you know who Warren Buffett is. He is the second wealthiest man in the world now, I think. Who is this? Pardon? Who? Warren Buffett. Buffett. I don't. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Okay. is in northern Mexico. To me, it's a Mesa high school. Warren Buffett. He's from Omaha. He owns C's Candy, and uh, he, had, he just gave Bill Gates about oh. $60 billion because uh, we met with Warren, and he said, I like what you guys do in uh, your foundation, but I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not uh, good at giving money away. And he proved it by giving sixty million dollars to Bill Gates. To do it. <laughs> so, um, but well. as for the mystery part, he was a bidder on our business. And he was in the chocolate business of seas, and he pretty much had the markets from the Mississippi to the West Coast. 
we were in the chocolate business, we pretty much had the markets from Mississippi to the East Coast. We had about 216 shops when we sold, and uh, we had about 300. Uh, the guy that wealthy, he can give away $30 million of chocolates and increase his sales. <laughs> Write it off. It's fair. You know, it's not a good but he said to us, because we sold those of you that are Fannie Mae fans, or you know, we had a frozen fresh line of chocolates. Where we had about 14 different packs of our chocolates that we could freeze and, and distribute through Jewel and Costco and Walgreens and uh, other things through uh, freezers. And we even had a charity program where we would give you the money to buy a freezer. And you could buy the chocolates for what half off, Mike, or something like that. And uh, and you could sell the chocolates at total retail, and that gave you fifty cents on the dollar to go to the charity of your purpose. So you could see them in hospital gift shops and educational institutions, etc. Uh, and he criticized us. He said, "Well, you know, by making it more available through non Fannie Mae." only outlets, you're taking the mystery away from the product. He's right. Mm -hmm. Very right. When you talk about mystery, you have to uh, do those things that add to your mystique. Uh, that's why I wonder sometimes with all these my place, my face, my space, where uh, people are revealing their whole lives and spilling all their guts Where's the mystery going to be? You know, it's like, I've been married 60 years, and uh, I never want to fully understand. In, in our house, it's a compliment if I say to my wife, you know, I still don't understand you. And she says, and that's the way we're going to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's give and take, see what I mean? Uh, but. But I think that's what you want to build into that, that if you get to know everything about every person, you will stop talking to each other totally. You know? uh, so you think I walk around my house naked at my age in this birthday suit? <laughs> that baby's so wrinkled. <laughs> I always leave a little to the imagination. <laughs> That's, 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 that's the mystery of life. I think I could take this in the room. <laughs> this, by the way, is my baseball hat. I own a uh, major owner of an independent professional baseball team, the Schomburg Flyers, just west of uh, O'Hara Field. That's what we call the Flyers. We have a 7,500 seating capacity. Our dimensions are the same as Wrigley Field. And our goal is probably to sell the, the cups for a big price. So, but uh, it's independent, so we get to say who plays, who pays. We have to have five newcomer youngsters who have never been paid to play baseball. Uh, you know, and to me in life, that's the problem of kids going to college and colleges becoming the minor leagues of baseball. They don't have to, they can make an error and there's no economic consequences of it. And it's too late in life to have that luxury of experimentation. So it's changed the game of baseball with pitchers, for instance, with starters and short relief and long relief, and long closers, closers and closers, and some guys that can only pitch 10 pitches that's their career. But I think that uh, that you got to play for money. You know, like it or not, we're a free enterprise capitalistic society. It's about the best we've ever seen. Yes, it's not perfect, uh, but it's better than other places that I've seen or would want to be. But I think that the opportunities, uh, if you have some adventure and are willing to uh, do things, you know, it's like when I did uh, my CPA firm, I would go so far as to say, uh, well, I'll do your federal income tax return this year for nothing. And if you really like it, then next year you can go through it and you can pay. And uh, they really liked it. And so next year they pay. And, you know, who knows? Maybe I charge them for last year too at the same time. It's, it's a mystery. 
if they liked it, what's the difference? They got their money's worth. Uh, and I kept them out of the penitentiary, and that's what they really charge you with doing. You know, they say, Mr. Hughes, we want every tax break that we're entitled to, but we don't want to go to the penitentiary. That was your purpose of it. Anyway, uh, that's the game. You've had the portfolio of baseball art. You've had the portfolio of chocolate art. You've had chocolates. You've had, oh, now you get the touch, feel, sense to experiment with uh, of baseball. So, you know, I want you, this is experiential learning. I'm not going to come here and talk about things that uh, you have to go out and find. I mean, if you're going to have to, to know what a baseball is, then you're going to be alert and wake up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here. Everybody happy? Yeah, everybody absolutely. Get, everybody get a chocolate? Yes, yeah, delicious. All your friends are wondering on where you got the ball. And don't tell them. Keep it a mystery. <laughs> Question. Anything goes. I believe I can almost answer every question. How'd you go from accounting to Fannie Mae? Well, they were fine. Oh, they were fine. And uh, one of the nice things about accounting is public accounting, you get a whole array of clients to work for. And then, again, if you're good, we're going to offer you jobs. Come to work for us. You know? So when you get ready to retire, I had my choice. I had a lot of candy companies. Clients, American Licorice Company, Fannie Mae Candy, Fannie uh, Company, uh, just so happy. You know, they get a reputation. Right? But um, I chose Fannie Mae because that's the guy I'm fishing, fishing with. And uh, I'll say it's cancer, it's sad, it's 61. But uh, it's a great business. You know, it's, uh, but, you know, you have to know the ins and outs. Uh, it's fresh product. You don't want it to get stale. You never want to get a reputation. You, people would bring a box of candy back saying, we didn't like this or this is what we wanted. You say, you keep it, we'll give you another box. You never took candy back in because you just couldn't have anybody saying, yeah, you know what happens to the stuff they took back. So uh, you just couldn't do business like that. And that's the way with your, your own work. You want to remember that if you know more about your clients, then they won't be taking the work back. Uh, able to tailor to your clients. So that's that's how I transitioned. The, uh, the people that own Fannie Mae, at that time Mr. and Mrs. Coleman with the Coleman Foundation, he had, uh, they invited me to come and join the company in 1975. Uh, and then he went to a place he had in Wyoming called Old Bog and died. So he wanted to give me a $75,000 signing bonus. So you get signing bonuses. You know, it's just like a commission piece in art. Um, and, but, and then his, um, his wife died two years later from cancer. Uh, that was 77, but you know, my friend by then, we'd made it so he was, they had no children, so he was their adopted son, so to speak. He came off of Good Bay, Alabama, a mud farm, poverty and so forth. And both worked very hard, and so they made it possible for him to take over the company. Um, so then when he died, well, that was my condition. You know, he said he'd be my trustee again. Uh, I've got a wife and four kids. Um, I want the boys in the business. I'd rather not have the girls in the business for the reason. You know, I didn't go along with that. I thought family's family and everybody's equal. So we had. The girls, or if the girls didn't want to come into business, their husbands could. Um, so I think that, uh, but all I said was, I know how to run this business. I know it would be profitable. I know it would grow. And when I've proven that, then I'd like to have a substantial interest, which I'll pay for. Um, you know, to, that'll be my benefits. So we did that, and in 1991, we sold the company. And, um, that was our prize. By hindsight, of course, you always think twice. And these days, I regret selling it. Uh, but then uh, there are other days I'm glad they're 
but it was a good business, a good product. We had good customers. We'd have generations that worked for us. Many of them were buried with boxes of candy uh, at their funeral. So uh, that's you know it's sad, but it's nice to hear that you're respected. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, there was an interesting editorial in the Tribune the last week or so about. Uh, uh, Buffett and Gates setting up this foundation to encourage high school students to learn to play bridge. And I don't know how successful that's going to be. I'd be curious about your thoughts about that. Or are there other games or sports that you think uh, help uh, people develop a, a mind or a spirit, a spirit to be a successful entrepreneur? What a great question. Yeah, well, I believe, uh, I totally believe it. My, my big game is baseball. I mean, I like all sports, but the sports metaphor of baseball to me fits life because. Uh, uh, you can't, you somehow have to get to first base. Now there's many ways to get there. You can be abused by the pitcher and get nailed with a pitch. Uh, you can get a walk because the pitcher can't find the plate. Or you can get a hit or a person can make an error. But you can't steal first base. But all the other bases in baseball you can steal. That's legal. And you read about it in the paper. Uh, and they go to great efforts to steal signs. They study, you know, because in giving signs in baseball, if you watch the coaches, they basically start out with a rule, the left side doesn't mean anything. So any signal like this, it may be our bunt signal, it may be our hit behind the runner signal, it may be wait for a walk signal, uh, but if it's on the left side, forget it. Now the other guys don't know that. They know your bunt signal, hit and run signal, they don't know that this side is meaningless and this is where all the action is. So that's 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 the basic of signals in baseball. And, and um, <laughs> so you uh, you know it's it's permissible in baseball to fake. It's like life. I mean, if you've got a guy on second and a line drive goes near you and it sounds like you might have a chance, you can go like that and he thinks you've got the ball and he hits back too second and gives up and next thing you know you can tag him out. So you can fake it or feign it as they say. Or you can go like that, the runner's not looking, he thinks he's got the ball and he just stops playing. So so faking in life is done. You have to always be buyer beware. So in baseball it's stealer beware. So you you have those kind of uh, of things that are part of the game. I, I think that's why they fit life. I think that uh, the computer games now that youngsters play, you can see different approaches by different youngsters. I know that uh, uh, he has two boys, and the younger one is a, is a computer person in the music production. And he would tackle a computer game, and he would go from here to here in solving the game. His the younger brother, who is a jock, Oh, that's the you know, right hitter. But when he did a, the same game, he would go from there to 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 there, you know. And his older brother would be astonished. He said, Do you know John had to go through every one of those trial and error steps to solve that problem? But he did. You know, it's like a simultaneous equation. <coughs> you can know the formula and solve the equation right away, or you could add and subtract, keep keep the equation and do it manually. So uh, I think that uh, I was talking to our investment managers the other day. We have a program that we engaged at Crystal Ray High School in Chicago out in the uh, highly Mexican neighborhood where uh, it's, it's a career education high school where the businesses employ one of their students one day a week. And they like the businesses to have five different students, whether they're law firms or retail or wholesale, it doesn't make any difference, or nonprofits, whatever. Uh, and then what they do, they pay $5,000 a semester for the students that they have. But they sign, the student signs that money over to school to pay for their tuition. Uh, and I think it's a great idea, although some days I think they should be working four days and going to school one day rather than working when they're going to school four. But uh, the, the investment manager was talking about hiring some of the students. And he was asking us about it. My own 
uh, thought, well, in the investment management business, is Jack be nimble these days, Jack be quick? You know, hedge funds, uh, market funds, you know, short and long positions, alternative investments, that's a quick game. That's, uh, that's not something for me to be doing anymore. But uh, on the other hand, if I were to look at the abilities, I would look at card players. You know, let's say, were you playing cards in sixth grade? Were you good at it? Uh, if you were in sports, did you figure up your earned run average, your batting average, your fielding percentage, and could you do it in your head? I mean, that was a that was a great advantage I had because I used to do fantasy baseball before it was in style. I'm talking about the 30s with a jackknife, and I'd flip it. And I kept a record of my players and the teams were my favorite colors, and of course the favorites always won. But uh, <laughs> but I calculated after every game the earned run average and the batting averages and so forth, and had a whole uh, season uh, doing it. But it we didn't have computers, we didn't have any machine, so I did it all in my head. And then I got so, because it was quicker if I just did it upside down, I got so I could add numbers upside down. I could do arithmetic upside down. That really helped me in later life. Uh, it, it also embarrassed me. At one time I was negotiating a contract with a guy down in Florida, and I was adding up his figures as he was writing them down. Of course, they were upside down. And I didn't realize that he observed that. And so he picked his head up and he was watching me. And then I finished doing the addition. And I picked my head up and he, like, oh, oh, he caught me. <laughs> but in any event, um, <laughs> but I think that's, that's the quickness uh, in youngsters today with the computers. Is, and I think that's how I've been researched and proven that the uh, quickness of youngsters that use computers, whether it be dexter, uh, you know, dexterity in their thumbs, the thumb generation, <laughs> or uh, whether it's uh, math, arithmetic skills. Uh, and I sometimes wonder uh, I sometimes wonder if we don't concern ourselves with the math problem and our students on the wrong basis. In other words, I think of math as being <coughs> relative to things. This is increasing, this is decreasing. Uh, line graphs, I mean, that's what I would show a youngster is a line graph and tell me, what does that mean? What does this mean compared to that? And how quick they would pick that up, regardless of what the graph was about. Uh, on the other hand, there are some youngsters that go through one and one is two, and two and two is four. Sometimes you want the person who comes up with two and two is six. Or better yet, you want the person to say, when you say to them, what's two and two, you say, what do you want? Is that an accountant? <laughs> yeah, no, it's an entrepreneurial accountant. Oh, we have to rise above our principles. <laughs> More questions? Because I'm very honest. Sure. Sure. You obviously have a very, uh, I'm going to call it upbeat philosophy, which is what you're presenting here. How, did, did you start with this, or is this something that evolved over time, or uh, did you, was this an experiential thing you just developed? This is the best way to deal with it. Well, I, I tell you, uh, I dropped out of high school in 1944 because I wanted to play baseball, and I did spend 1944 in the field because of rookie leads who were ready to play. big shock to us when we came back. We said, gee, what the hell are we going to do? We didn't think it would come back. And that's why the GI Bill was so, uh, the second best thing of that century was the GI Bill next to winning that war. Because 16 million of us came back. And they, if you let us all out on the same day, we'd have continued the war on this side. <laughs> that's because that's why we were trained. So by letting us gradually go back into the universities and colleges and continue my education through GED, get my high school diploma, and then go to the college. Uh, and then the good fortune of, along the way of, of you know, no fatal disease, uh, being adventuresome and not breaking, that's the only thing ever broken. That's the result of a line drive, but uh, uh, no money to fix it with. <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, 
even though I didn't make it in baseball, I, I use the metaphor, so I'm still involved in baseball in, in this. Uh, so uh, good fortune has uh, something to do with it. But I think uh, one of the impressions was uh, early in my life, probably around ninth grade, uh, I lived in a small town in Wisconsin, and I was pretty upset with my home life because um, I didn't want to go to school. There were other things more attractive. So I ran away from home. And uh, being in a small town, I didn't uh, <coughs> couldn't conceal my runaway. I just leave town. I just hung out someplace. And, uh, and after a couple of days, I realized by checking around, nobody's looking for me. Yeah. <laughs> Including my parents. I even kind of walked back to the house and see if they closed off my bedroom. <laughs> of course, they had three boys in the same room, so there would be some objections. But anyway, but that really made an impression on me that finally after three or four days, I just went home. I said, this is not good. You know, I'd rather put up with that stuff at home, <coughs> good home cooking. And, uh, good spanking once in a while, uh, rather than be out here uh, doing that. But uh, through that experience, it developed hope. You know, all was not lost. Uh, there were alternatives. And, uh, and then, I think going into the profession, the CPA, I couldn't believe how much people relied on me. And that gets us back into the senses. I would get so trusted. Uh, you know, because I wasn't easily intimidated, so they really wanted me to fight with the Internal Revenue Service, and I really enjoyed fighting with them. And I would really sometimes get so provoked, and I'd say, well, let's go outside and settle this. <laughs> that might be the de best tax law there is. But uh, the, the, uh, the thing was that so many people started relying on me, who had better educations than I, who had more money than me, but wouldn't make a move without me. Uh, and, and they'd go to a sales meeting, for instance, and come out at 2 in the morning and their car would be gone because it was stolen. And they'd call me before they'd call the insurance company or the police because they figured I had a little more stuff. I wouldn't even know where it's at. <laughs> you know? so it's, uh, but that's how you build that. And, and I think that's the <coughs> deprivation today of kids, uh, you know, like those young kids. I mean, how often are they able to walk to their destination uh, for fear of some abuse or some kind of activity? Or even young ladies like that, or young men like these guys. I mean, these guys are pretty tough guys. They're like those two guys on television. What was their name? So, but the you know, hope is, actually I think this is the century of hope. I was talking to, I think, Pamela about it, that through the end of the 90s was sort of the reconstruction era. And there's a lot of programs in place and there's a lot of huge funds of money going in to correct those things we saw, but people generally don't know that because there's so much media that plays it down or misdirects it or whatever, that people now need hope. Social workers, need hope. You know, social workers is a very dangerous profession because you become callous with all the uh, negativity and with all the hardship. And if you're dealing with that problem day in and day out, you become callous to it. Uh, and you worry sometimes that we're not too callous to life itself. But I think if you can switch and you see that there is hope because of conferences like this, schools like that, People like them, people like yourself who care enough, that's all hope. And so I, I don't think you can identify hope, this is how you get it, but that's why I go to the senses. By touching enough, smelling enough, seeing enough, hearing enough, knowing enough, uh, you build a hope. Um, so I, I try to if, if I have to do something, I want to think it through to myself and determine what's best for me. It's not always right, but uh, 
So far, so good. Everybody got enough baseballs? Everybody got enough chocolates? John, thank you. Thank you.